All right, so let's, uh, let's continue on. We have an exam on Monday. So you need to be ready for that. There's plenty of practice problems to work on there. And uh, today's topic is uh, functions. But before I jump into that, do you have any questions? Maybe regarding the exam or anything like that? Any problems that you're stuck on you want to look at? No? OK. All right, we looked at this problem last time, generating random color strings. And uh, today, I want to introduce functions by looking at one of the problems in the, uh, what is it, the name of that lab? Is it uh, expressions or algorithms? This one here, listing prime numbers. So here, the problem in this exercise, which you know, you're either working on or you finished, that uh, you need to ask the user for a number, and then print all of the prime numbers uh, between two and that number. So ask the user for a number. And then print all the prime numbers between 2 and that number. So I'm asking the user for a number. Let's read the number in. We read the number in. <clears throat> then we're going to compute. We're going to print all the prime numbers that are less than or equal to n. So we do, what we'll do is we'll have a loop and start at 2 and go up to n and test for each value in that loop. We'll look at each value, 2, 3, 4, 5, like that. Test if it's a prime number. If it is, then we'll print it. So the it's a simple loop. starts at 2 and goes to n. So we'll use a for loop for that. That's the appropriate uh, loop to choose for that. And I'll use i as the index, or the counter. And then you know we're just going to say we're going to end up printing i if uh, if i is prime. So if i is prime, then print this. I'm going to make that a comment. That's just pseudocode. I'm just going to comment that out. So let's pretend that every i is prime. Just, just to check our code to see if it's working right. So n is uh, 5. 2, 3, 4. Ah, we didn't print 5, so we have a bug already. We need to stop. We need to include n. Also, I don't need a new line here. So we're debugging already at this level, just with the shell of a program. Two, three, four, and five. There we go. Now we need to omit the four. You know, or whatever. We need to we need to uh, weed out the, the non primes. So how do we test if um, if i is prime? Well. We have a. Um, we'll start with the assumption that i is prime. And then we'll, um, you know, do stuff. And then. <coughs> right now, we'll uh, be more precise than that. Um, look for a divisor uh, for i. And then if we find a divisor, set i is prime to false.
So if i is prime, and notice that I'm using the Boolean variable directly in the, the if condition area. I don't need to do this. I don't need, this is um, unnecessary. So if i is prime is true, then do that. Well, so, so this is an expression. When it evaluates the true, then print i. But we don't need that. That's too much. It's more than we need. This, this variable by itself stands alone is an expression that evaluates the true or false. So this is generally what you'll see. Maybe you can do it the other way if it helps your thinking. But as you become better at programming, this is what you'll write. If you're similar to most other programs. All right. Once again, we can test the uh, test the code at this point. It does the same thing, but it compiles and runs. So we have runnable. And now let's look for a divisor for i. So basically, we, we need to scan. Uh, let's let's look, let's use a d or k for the divisor. I know what we could do. Yeah, we can use k. We'll start with two, and we don't want to hit i. That's not right. So let's look for a divisor. So we're going to use this variable k as a possible divisor. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll write it out. Divisor. Let's write it out like that. So now we have the variable name is more expressive. Is that how you spell divisor, or is it with a D? It's right. It's OK? All right, so um, <coughs> you know, look at our Boolean variable. Instead of declaring it B, we declared it you know, I is prime. It's expressive. Instead of using k, we use the word the name divisor. So if um, if i mod divisor is zero, then i is prime is set to false. So if we find a divisor, then we're going to set that Boolean variable to false. We can let the loop keep going, or we can break. I'll just let it go. I'm not programming for efficiency here. We're just trying to figure out how to get the problem solved and uh, pick good variable names. But efficiency is also uh, important, but not as important as uh, readability, usually. Right. So uh, <coughs> that's it. I think that's all the code we need right there. All right, now five, we should print, let's see, two, three, five, right? Yeah. Please read five. What about um, 20? We'll just check it. 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13, 17, 19. That looks good. So we got that. This was um, uh, lab three. Now I, I want to show you how to reorganize this code using a function. Maybe it'll make it easier to, uh, to understand. Well, define this function uh, called uh, isPrime. 
Now, functions have names. So here's the name of the function, is prime. Functions, they return values. They, when they Functions are expressions that evaluate the values. And the, the data type of the value that the function evaluates to is uh, written first when you define the function. So is prime is going to return a Boolean value. So the function is prime returns a Boolean value. It has the same order that this declaration has. N is a variable of data type int. Is prime is a function that returns data type bool. You see that? The data type comes first. Name of the function comes second. Data type goes first. Name of the variable comes second. Now the function has an input. So it has an output bool. That's considered the output of the function. But there's also an input. And the inputs we list in parentheses in here. These are the inputs to the function. And then we have this open and close brace, just like main. See, main is actually a function. See, the main has two inputs, int argc, char pointer args bracket for array. We'll get to this syntax later. So that there are two inputs, and they're separated with a comma. That's called a delimiter. You can have zero inputs. Of one input or any number of inputs. There may be some max, but uh, probably you'll never hit it. All right, so um, in our case, what we want to do is pass in an integer, say, k, and, um, you know, and then if, if k, if k is prime, then, uh, then return true. See, otherwise, we're going to return false. And when I say return here, I mean that's what the function evaluates to. So in the inside the function, the function uses these braces to identify a block of computer instructions, a block of statement, just like main. Main, the block of statements in main is right there in between those braces. So this function is just like main. It has its statements inside of this block. Now when you, you invoke the function or you, you evaluate the function as an expression, and at the, so the code inside that block, that code block, it runs. And at any point in that code, you can say, I'm done. I know what this function evaluates to. It evaluates to true, or it evaluates to false, whatever. Okay, so those are the two possibilities because the data type is bool. <coughs> so that's what the word return means. To return true means evaluate to true, replace, you know, me as an expression being invoked with the value true. All right, so let's let's get this written up. And but it's here. The code for that is right here. Four lines right there. I'm gonna cut those four lines and drop them in right there. So inside this function. We declare is prime, a variable is prime to be true. And we loop. Oh, look, the value that we want to test is not an i, it's a k. I put a k there, didn't I? So either I change this to k, or else I change the argument to k. It doesn't matter. Sir, did any of that line be i? Cool i to be prime? Yeah, actually. We would change that to k is prime if we want to use k, right? I mean, the one above. Here? Cool is prime. What about that? It doesn't have to match the i is prime? Um, no, we're going to change that. And I'll show you because down here is where we call it. This is the function, is prime. And when we call the function, we pass in i as the argument. 
So is prime, and it takes the value i, is i prime? We wouldn't want to say i is prime there because we don't know the, the code that's calling the function if you're going to use a variable called i or not. It doesn't matter. We don't need to constrain the calling code to use a variable called i to pass in to the function. We could pass in, uh, we could pass in n. The function should still run correctly. We don't want to say i is prime there. Just is prime. Is n prime here? Is n prime? Is i prime? Is k prime? Whatever. Now, so it takes the argument. But this, like, this is arbitrary. We could, you know, we could give this any name we like. We could, we could call it prime. It just has to match up here. See, this, these are, this is naming. This is where we invoke the function where we call it, where we execute it, where we evaluate it. All those expressions are the same thing. And this is where we define the function. This is where we tell the compiler, this function exists. These are the statements that execute when the function evaluates. So we need to have these names need to be the same. And the compiler doesn't care what the names are. They need to be legal names. It cannot be an illegal name. Let's show, I'll show you two, two prime. This will be rejected by the compiler because function names cannot start with a numeric value. However, they can start with an underscore, so that one's okay. But I'm going to use the word is prime here for the name of the function. So I think it's more expressive. I think it makes it easier to read and understand the code, but that's um, that's that. So this is where we call the function down here. Let's look at this. So arranging from two to n for each value i between two and n, we call that function is prime. And if it returns true, we're going to output i. And once again. Just to, just to emphasize the separation here, and let me wait on that. We don't have the return statement yet. There it is. So there's the Boolean variable. This is where we return it. Yeah. The Boolean variable, what about the i is prime equal to zero? Does that mean false? That i is equal to zero? That will be accepted by the compiler and it will not run correctly because it will be false. You should set it to one. Okay, yeah. Zero. Set it to minus one. Anything that's non zero is interpreted as true. So yeah, false is zero. False is only zero is for false. However, that is, code is not considered readable, it's not expressive. It looks like you're, it's a number variable, and this shouldn't be a number. This is because the, this language is a bit old. New languages wouldn't let you do that. If you declare is prime to be bool in C sharp, you can't set it to zero. The compiler will refuse to, because you don't need to do that. This, this is an old, this is tied to the past. Uh, so, you know, we're, um, we wanted to develop new habits, but we're not forced into those habits. On the other hand, you want to know about this because you'll, you may be looking at old code that actually the programmer is using a zero instead of the word false. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, like, let's say if we do a function with the uh, integer function yeah. and we return zero, that does not. That, that's good. That's good, correct? Yeah. We can do that. What if we return one? Does that change anything? No, it's just that's an integer, right? Correct. Return one, minus one, ten, any, you know, any integer you can return. Here we want to return any bool, which is true or false. Once again, you can return 11. What does 11 mean? True. It's true. Anything that's non-zero is true. But don't, don't use that. It's just if you're looking at old sloppy code or something like that, you know, or C very early C code. Where they didn't have true or false defined. They're going to use zeros and ones. 
also it's good to know because if you could have a bug in your in your code like this will function this will like radically so why would we want to do that all right let's see if we got this let's see if that works oops five seems to work Fine. yeah looks good Now the 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 benefit of this function here is that uh, we don't have a nested loop. Oh, nested loops are hard to think about, aren't they? Maybe not. Sometimes you can have three loops or four loops or five loops, five levels of nested loops. I mean that that's getting tough to manage. And it normally would break that into functions. So here we've removed the inner loop with a call to this function as prime. Well, it makes the code easier to read, easier to understand, easier to modify, easier to debug. <clears throat> now, if you look at this code, we can we have what one, two, three, four, five lines of code here. It's not too bad, but we can get rid of one of these lines of code. In fact, we can get rid of this variable is prime. Now why why have more code to read than we need? You know, I mean, it's possible to compress things too much, and then you lose expressiveness. So we don't want to do that. But we do want to get rid of anything that is not needed. And so we can, the term here is refactor. We can refactor this code so that it's uh, more compressed and still easy to read. So that's the term, refactoring. Refactoring means kind of like cleaning up, simplifying, but not oversimplifying. Making things consistent. That's called refactoring. And a lot of the times when you're coding, you're just refactoring. Just sometimes if you're stuck on a bug, just start refactoring. Say, well, I'm going to clean up. I'm going to change my variable names to make them more expressive. I'm going to fix my indentation problems, which you should always you know, get to early anyway, and uh, break things into functions uh, when it makes the code easier to look at. So you should, you're not directly attacking the bug because you're stuck on it, can't figure it out. Well, you're stuck on the bug. Then switch to refactoring gear, start cleaning. It's one of the reasons you're stuck on the bug is because your code may not be very readable. So let's make it, let's focus on the readability of it. And then all of a sudden you're noticing, oh, oh, I'm setting J to 2 here. Ah, that's the bug. I got to set J to 0 or, you know, whatever. So that's a very, uh, that's, a, that's a good to sort, of, um, uh, sort of strategy shift to make when you're up against a, a bug. So I'm going to take this out. We don't need is prime. Because once we find a divisor, we can return false right there on the spot. There's no reason to do any more of the loop. This also speeds up the code because we don't have to continue with the loop. So you don't have to return at the end of the function. You can return anywhere. Remember, return means this is the value that the function evaluates to in the expression which it appears. Down here, this means we didn't find, at this point, we go through the loop, see? It means we, we didn't find a divisor. If we found a divisor, we would have returned false there. Uh, but we didn't, oh, I got that wrong, didn't I? Oh, yeah, if we, here we find a divisor, so we return false. It can't be prime. Here, we've gone through all values of divisor from 2 to i, minus 1, and we did not find a divisor, and therefore i is prime. Let's return true. See, we this is easier. This is more compressed. We, but we have two return points. I wanted you to see that. Let's check, it, check the correctness of that logic. Let's 
good. Now I, I want to make another point here. Look at where we're calling the function is prime i. Now this i here has what's called a scope. Let me show you this. Right here, after that if statement, I can output that i. See that? I can output that i right in that for statement. So now, I'm, the, the, what I want to talk about now is this concept called scope. You see where I'm printing the i? I is visible at that point. Now, let's suppose I took that out and uh, tried to print it there. What's going to happen? It's an error. What kind of an error? Remember, there's two kinds of errors. Compilation errors, runtime errors. Runtime error is a logic error, usually. What's that? Runtime. Is a runtime uh, runtime error? You think this will compile? What do you think the compiler will think i is? You think the compiler will think i is the i that we defined here, or the i that we defined there? In other words, see this i is out of scope. This i here, this is where we declare i. And it's only visible inside the substatements of the for loop. It's not visible outside the loop. So when we try to use i here, the compiler will say undefined symbol i, undefined identifier. Let's see that. Oops. Use of undeclared identifier i. You see that? Because i is out of the scope of i. Do you, you know what I mean by scope? Like um, Fred. Hi, Fred. Fred, please stand up. Well, Fred is in the other classroom. So the name Fred has no meaning in this scope, in this classroom. So I has no meaning here. <clears throat> now this is also a separate scope. And I here is different than the I there. So if I know there's a David next door and I'm a David here and I say, you know, I'm David. You know, it's me. It's not the other David. So there's there's two there's a, two instances of the same name, but they're two different people. Here we've got the same variable name, but they both refer to different locations in RAM. They're two different uh, memory states. Two different numbers. So it might be confusing to you. I'm using i here, and that's, oh, it has to be i. That's what we're passing in i. That's not the case. This can be a k. i got to change that to k, see? Because this i here referred to that i. The i that was here did not refer to the i that was declared there. Another I. I didn't get the other I. There we go. One more topic I want to talk about. 
called forward declarations. Maybe you decide that this is more readable. You want the function to follow me. The thing is, the compiler looks at this code and tries to understand it sequentially. So when it gets to this point, it's going to say, I don't know what is prime is. Well, I'm going to tell you it's down here, but the compiler does not look ahead. It just stops right there and says, undefined identifier. Use of undeclared identifier, something like that. Use of undeclared identifier is prime. But we want to leave the function definition down here. So what we do is use what's called a forward declaration. And we just give the signature of the function, what it looks like on the outside, what the data type it evaluates to, the data type it returns, and the, um, the parameters and their data types, the parameter list. But then we have a semicolon right away. We don't provide the implementation detail. We just give it signature, what it looks like on the outside. And we delay the implementation details till later in the code. So here we're telling the compiler, look, we're going to get around to is prime, consider it a function, consider it to evaluate the goal, and consider it to take a single argument, uh, which is of type int. And uh, the compiler, when it gets here, it'll say, well, you know, I know that this spot uh, can evaluate the bool that's syntactically correct. And we are passing in an int as its argument, so that's OK. And the programmer told me that, it, that he's going to get around to um, providing that implementation, so I'll, I'll trust him on that. There it is. That's a forward declaration. <clears throat> now this works because the compilation goes in two passes. In the first pass, the uh, compiler generates what's called object code, which is these machine instructions. But the machine instructions are not fully, uh, they're not complete yet. They have references to things like functions, calls into the system library. And they're not, they don't yet have, uh, they're not yet connected to the function itself. So that's a process called linkage, or resolving these um, uh, references in the object code. So the compiler will take this. <coughs> It's not a, it's, now it's a different kind of compilation error. It's actually, it will generate the object code, but it will fail in the linking phase, which is phase two. Let me show that to you. <clears throat> now normally when I run that command, the compiler says, well, you didn't tell me exactly what to do, so I'll assume you want me to compile and then wait. But let's tell the compiler only to compile. I think it's that. Okay, I don't do this very often. So I think this says, compiler, just, just compile this source code into object code, but don't try to link it yet. Okay, so that, that succeeded. You see that? But look, main.o. That's the object code. So that's it's uh it's on its way. To, this is this is machine instructions that are on their way to becoming a runnable program, but they're not quite there yet. So this is phase one of compilation. They call it compilation, generation of the object code. So if you want to link this thing, I'm going to guess at this. This is. Um, LD is the name of the linker on, on Unix systems. So it's, uh, I think I can just do that. 
Maybe not. Well, no, it's supposed to fail, by the way. So let me, I'm, not, I'm getting too fancy here. So I, now I don't want to only compile. I want to compile and link. There we go. Now we get the error. Undefined symbols is prime. That's the undefined symbol. Is prime in? You told me that you were going to provide an implementation for it, but I couldn't find it when I tried to link to it. And then here, LD, that's the name of the linker. So, um, let's bring that back in again. So we, defi we define it here. See if there's anything else I wanted to talk about there. I don't think so. So that's uh, that's the overview of functions. Any questions about functions? Side effect, reference parameters, scope. So we talked about scope. Stepwise refinement, I'm constantly talking about that. Pseudocode, I talk about that. I use those in comments. Performing walkthroughs, that's what that second exercise, that's what the lab one is, is about, is reading the code and, and, and understanding it, walking through the code. So, so that, that's what the exam one is all about. Understanding preconditions. How to enforce them with the assert statement. And why don't we do that? Let's understand the preconditions and how to assert them with the, uh, enforce them with the assert statement. So here, this, uh, this code here, I kind of like it up here better because it's it's less less lines of code. That's one thing. Now, what happens if we um, what happens if we run this and we do one? one is one prime or not? I don't know if it even has an answer. Undefined. It hey, doesn't even say anything. Look at that. The code doesn't even work. It's divisible by one in itself, right? Yep. Definition of prime number, right? Oh, wait a minute. There's a reason one is not prime. Anybody know? It's not, not even considered when you're thinking about priming. It has to do with computer science calculus. Uh, it's a math thing. It's not a computer science. This is a question to math majors. Math majors, why? What is one? Is it prime or not prime? We know two is prime. No, I'm saying that it has to be bigger than one to be prime. It has to be bigger than one to be prime. They don't define primeness for numbers less than two. Thank you. For some reason. They do that. And this has been thought about for thousands of years. So you know, I don't think we want to try to change the, the convention on that. <clears throat> so, but look, it doesn't run correctly for one. Yeah, so the thing is this, we can assert that uh, K is greater than one. 
you know, or maybe it's easier to do it like this. K is greater than or equal to 2. And uh, now we could, oops, well, undeclared identifier assert. So it should be include C assert. Assert, that means it's a, it's not, it looks like a function. You can think of it as a function, but in reality, it's a thing called a macro. But, you know, it, it works like a function. Anyway, it takes an expression and it evaluates expression. If the, if the expression evaluates a true, it just doesn't do anything. It just quietly finishes. It. But if the expression that's passed into it evaluates the false, it terminates the program with an error message and gives you the line number, hopefully. So that's okay. Or well, if we pass it a one. Oh, what's going on? Did I save that? <coughs> what is going on? How come that doesn't work? K is greater than or equal to two. Maybe the um, Oh, I know what's going on. I think the compiler is, um, maybe it has to do with this object code? Is that what it is? I don't get it. What am I doing wrong? Oh, this is a total mystery here. Maybe the um, so, and I, I don't even print. Somehow this is not compiling. What's going on? Well, that should give me an error message. Watch this. This will fail. Should fail to compile. I just put an X right there. Right. That should fail to compile. Let's see. Yeah, X is bad, right? So, you know what it is? Maybe assertions are turned off. Something like that. How do I turn off? Probably a turn off assertions. So it's um, X code. Never been turned off before. Or maybe it's in like debug mode. Something like that. No, I never had this happen before. So, you know, uh, let me think. Uh, all right. Um, oh, I see. This is um, so pretty much. This will print, all right? Oops. It still is not printing. What's going on? Oh, I think I'm not. Uh, this is is prime i. Do it. 
Oh, I don't enter the loop. Ay, ay, ay. Okay. That was bad. I never enter the loop, so I should have noticed that before. Like, n is a 1, so this condition fails. 2 is not less than or equal to 1. So this is not a good example. So we never end up calling as property. So anyway, this is not a good example. I can't make this work. This, uh, I cannot use this code for this to demonstrate this um, this concept of, well, I can. I can use it. I don't need this anymore. I'm just playing around. <coughs> so then I could do, um, is prime n. All right, so I'm going to read in n, and I'll print out is prime n. There we go. That'll work. Four. Zero. See, that's why in C++, if I put in a five, what's it going to print? Is it one or minus one? See, in C++, bully, bools are represented internally as um, integers. So we should do this. Let's do if is prime n, then C out prime. Else C out. Not, not prime. There it is in one long line. If C out prime, I forgot the semicolon. So uh, five prime, four not prime. Here we go. One assertion fail. Yeah, it works. All right, get that done before the end of the lecture. That's what we wanted there. So we can we can use assert to enforce um, what are called. Uh, what do we call it? Input constraints? Constraints on input? Preconditions, that's what I'm saying. Preconditions. But in this class, we're not really going to use um, assert for um, preconditions. We're going to use uh, assertions for um, testing. And let me show you how that works. Like this, this code, we want to test our is prime function. So what we do is we we call is prime and pass in a number. You know that's that should be and I'm, I know it's not needed, but I'm going to do it like that anyway. So two is prime, three is prime, four is not prime. So these are tests. So when I, I call is prime, I want it to return true. So I pass that expression, I put that inside of a call to assert. Another way to do these, you could also make it look like this. Because we don't need that. You know, that two is prime, that this expression evaluates the true is good. This should evaluate the true. This should not, this should evaluate the false. So we can do it like this. Not is prime. So those are, those are two ways to write these tests. Oh, I don't need that 
and anymore. What am I doing? I don't need this. And uh, this is what we're going to do. All test passed. But something went wrong there. All test passed. There it is. All test passed. So we have a bunch of assertions, you know, calling a function that we want to test, checking the return value to see it's what we want it to be. And, uh, and then if we, once we get through all those assertions, it's all a test passed. Now, what if we had a bug in the code here? Say, instead of looking for zero, we look for a one. And there's a bug. So that, hopefully our test cases are good enough to find this bug. It's possible we have bad test cases and we don't find the bug. Assertion failed. Is prime 3 equals true? Well, wait a minute. 3 is prime. So there's a bug in the code and then you go back, of course, you find the problem, fix the bug, go back, Test again. All test pass. So that's we'll be doing this a lot. This format here. We we'll use assertions with test cases to, uh, and this becomes our you know what you would submit as a as an assignment. All right. That's called unit testing. See, the uh, we're thinking of this function as a unit, and that we're we're testing it. So we're you know. Passing in different, using different test cases to, to check it. Boundary cases. Test coverage. See, so now we're talking about testing here. You know, this doesn't test a lot of values. So, you know, the, I would say that it doesn't have great coverage, but. Um, I've, see, I've seen students submit code in the past which would only fail, would, which would start to fail at 27, but would pass for everything before there. So just two, checking 2, 3, and 4 is, is not that great. Now 2 is special because it's the smallest prime number. So that's what's meant by a boundary case. It's something on the edge. Smallest possible value. Largest possible value. That's a, a zero, something that's uh, special. And so you, you should test boundary cases, and you want to have good coverage. You want to make sure that you find the error. I'll give you an example. Let's suppose we did um, We'll test 4 and 27. But our code is actually invalid because we have returned false here. So this, these test cases have poor coverage because they never execute this one line here. They don't reach that line. They're only, they only hit this return. So it's poor coverage. We don't cover all the, the statements in the code. We're missing this one. So this, this uh, function is incorrectly implemented. But when we compile and run the tests, it say they're all passed. We know that that's, these are bad tests. It has poor coverage. Let's, let's improve our coverage by uh, returning true here. By uh, passing in 5, rather, and seeing that it returns true. Now the test code has better coverage. And as a result, we catch the bug. Let's look at another example. Suppose we did this. 
suppose we start at a three. Now the problem here is, it's not a great example, but uh, was it four? I'm going to make that an eight. Wait a minute. No, I'm not going to get into that. <clears throat> and this, we're not going to look at the debugger. We're not going to do that. But if you have Visual Studio, I can I can show you how to use the debugger on that system or in Xcode running in graphics mode. All right, then the only thing left here is this side effect to talk about and reference parameters. So I'm going to show you a side effect. Uh, I'm going to check this, make sure this code is running. Good. So we have uh, declared an integer n. Let's read it in. And then if uh, n is prime, then we're going to um, print prime. And I'm trying to get everything crammed in here. But we're, it's not that bad uh, what we have left to do. We get it done in five minutes. And there we go. So there's our program. Same bug I had last time right there. We read a number and we tell the user whether it's prime or not. Prime. Prime. Not prime. What's that? Point point seven. Not prime. Good. Thank you. So it's good. <coughs> and what was I trying to do? Side A side effect. Sorry, not reference term. A side effect. So, well. What we could do, if when you wrote this pro problem, you could do it like this. Let's suppose we uh, we print the result here. Well, that's not going to work. Can't we need to print before returning? All right. So now in the main function, all we have to do is call is prime directly, and it, we're relying on the side effect. So is is prime prints whether the value n is prime or not. See that? That's called the side effect. The function is prime just by the name of the function. You know, it says, te you know, what we're doing is we're testing whether it's prime and printing the value if it is prime. It's doing more than it's supposed to do. It has a side effect. It's returning true and false, like it was originally intended to. But then it has this side effect. It prints the value as well. But you can have situations where you don't want the side effect. 
then this function doesn't work very well for you. Also, when you ha rely on a side effect like this, it's hard to read the code. It's considered um, uh, bad, bad practice and, and, and is unreadable. So when you do your programming, <laughs> avoid side effects like this. Don't rely on them. Take them out. All right, that's it. We can't get to reference parameters. We'll get to that next time. Good luck on Monday.